Phil, I would love to jump right in with a time travel today. So I am distinctly a 90s kid, born in 89, and I have lots of fond memories, teachers wheeling in a TV with a VHS set up to play the science guy growing up. VHS, um, yes. Absolutely, yeah. Um, only um, reference lost on many of the younger <laughs> listeners. Still around. Um, were there any episodes of sketches that you really loved at the time or even still think about today? Well, what I'd say all the time is there's at least one thing in every show that I just, just think is great, <laughs> but, but, uh, you know, getting a ride in the blue angels, the Navy fighter plane, that was cool. The A6 Navy plane, that was cool. But having a cubic meter of seawater talking about plankton and then doing a spit cake for kids was, you know, that's great. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. I mean, it's a stupid thing. You pick up a beaker of water and spit it out because it's salty and it's hilarious. When you first started developing the show, did you have any sense of what a massive reach it would end up having? Was there a well, moment kind of during the reception where you realized, oh, wow, this thing is taken off? Well, when the vice president called me at home one time, that was cool. I still don't get it. I say this all the time. The number of people that come up to me, the number of people who are affected by the show, like you, you talk about the VHS, the cart being wheeled into the classroom. It's just amazing. It's hard to, it's hard to grasp. I was in the train station a couple of years ago in Bayou, France, where the Bayou tapestry is, and there's a castle or a giant cathedral. And this guy comes up to me, yeah, I watch your show. Sir, aren't you a French? Yes. Wait, oui, wait. Oui. The guy. He and his buddies watched the show online, I guess. And then I've been in London and Japan, let alone anywhere in the U.S. I was just in Canada too. We had a huge following on something called TV Ontario, an equivalent of public broadcasting. And it's just, man, it's overwhelming. There have been many, many, many moments where I had that feeling. Wow, right. this is a big deal. Yeah. That's amazing. My lab coat, my first lab coat is on display in the Smithsonian right now. Wow. In Washington, DC. Wow. You know, and I'm not dead. You know what I mean? It's just, yeah. it's really something. No, really that's amazing. a pretty, pretty wild full circle moment. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting to me, just kind of how much the landscape of science communication has changed kind of drastically since the nineties. Uh, in your opinion, what are some of the biggest changes in how you communicate science to the public? Do you think you have to kind of grab people by the shoulders a little bit more today, metaphorically speaking? Well, two things, I think, first of all, the anti-science movement or anti-intellectualism has really taken hold in a way that surprises, I think, everybody. <laughs> and then, well, the other thing is. You know, when we made the Science Guy show, there were sort of three and a half networks. You know, I mean, there was public broadcasting, but many, many people just didn't embrace it. So it was a different time. There were three television networks. Cable television was new and uh, public broadcasting uh, was extant both uh, on broadcast and then later on uh, on cable. But there were a limited number of venues or outlets rather. And now all these young people with their electric computers, uh, now you watch science education on your own device. And another thing has changed, I think is what maybe you're driving at. We all self-select much more strongly than I think we did when there were fewer outlets. Sure. In other words, if you are really into physics, you watch Veritasium with Derek Mower or Physics Girl, Diana Cowern. Uh, if you're really into marine biology, you watch uh, the Discovery Channel uh, online for cetaceans or marine mammals, what have you. And so uh, we self-select, I think, in a more specialized way than maybe 30 years ago. But, you know, anybody who watched Mr. Wizard, as I did growing up, or the Science Guy show in syndication or in public broadcasting, you're self-selecting also. But there was a parental control element to it, I think. And your science teacher had a adult control <laughs> aspect. So I guess it's changed. 
in the self-selecting specializing kind of way, in specializing kind of way. And the, and then the other thing is the anti-intellectualism. I've done my own research on viruses. Really? You screwed it up. <laughs> you didn't do a good job. So, yeah. And that kind of ties into my next question. You know, you've been a pretty vocal critic of kind of how poor science literacy has become in the U.S. Um, what do you think are well, some of the most effective ways to get people to engage with science topics that might be at odds with their well, personal or me, political beliefs? It's not that science literacy is down so much as the anti-science, like a person presumes that he or she knows better than experts without any good reason to believe that. That's really, I think, what's really a problem for us in the United States right now, where the United States would nominally be the world's leader in any sort of technology or science, but now we're also the world leader in anti-science, anti-intellectualism, and that's, you know, not and what's everybody's favorite word? That's not sustainable. You can't run a technically complicated society with fewer and fewer people who know how it all works. And now everybody's running circles screaming about artificial intelligence, which is maybe a good thing, intelligence, which is maybe a good thing to be concerned about. Having people that don't understand it is a bad thing, one way or the other. What do you think are effective ways to get people to engage well, yeah. with science topics that might be at odds with well, their watch watch the end is nigh on peacock and turn it up loud that's the key no uh that's ironic no i so we chip away at the problem you know when you meet people who don't accept climate change or don't accept the efficacy of wearing a mask during a pandemic you're not going to change that person's mind just by talking to them once you have to have a steady calm message for about two years for most people to change their minds. You know, sure. now when the pandemic started, everybody was saying it's the government trying to tell you, not everybody. Anti-science people were saying it's the government trying to control your life and stuff. And then you had a million people die of COVID. And then these studies, these maps you'd read on the counties where people were wearing masks had fewer deaths by, you know, extraordinary factors of two or three or 10 versus counties or states where they weren't wearing masks. There were interviews of people who contracted COVID and realized how serious it was and then became advocates for masks. In this one example, it takes a couple of years for people to change their minds. If somebody believes in the haunted house or astrology, the first time you point out that astrology is bunk, they don't just abandon it. It takes a couple of years, steady information for that person that changes over their mind. I do want to talk about the end of my, and that kind of ties into one of my questions about your show, which is, was covering pandemics something that you considered when, when oh, they yeah. Yeah, but, but it was, we were in the middle of a pandemic, so we didn't do it. It's a great question. Yeah. The movie Contagion was very popular, a well done, a disaster movie. And people rented it at a record level during the, you might think we'd all want to watch romantic comedies, you know, and get away from the problem, from the situation, but no. People wanted more so that we did not do a pandemic because we were in the middle of one. And the other one we didn't do is what we roughly call totalitarianism, where a strong man leader kind of messes things up. You know, history is replete these things, but we didn't do that one either. Talking about movies like Contagion, I was kind of pleasantly surprised as a movie guy that the end is nigh plays out like a disaster movie. You know, you're cross-cutting between different characters and vantage points, and there's lots of spectacle. Why did you decide to frame the show that way? Oh, well, the guy, in my opinion, in the writer's meeting, who really had the insight was Seth MacFarlane himself. He said, conservative media scare people. We need to scare people. And Brandon Braga was a producer with me on The End is Night. He did the Star Trek movies. He works on the Orville with Seth MacFarlane. Anyway, he loves disaster movies. So we homed in on this idea. The disaster movie at the beginning, optimistic view of the future with science in the second half. And that's what we did. I love that. Do you think that there's kind of a balancing act or a risk of kind of that positive messaging being lost among all the spectacle and CGI? Or is it a way to help people engage with it? Well, I think the CGI makes it disasters seem more plausible. I mean, for sure to me, you know, when you see the volcanic pyroclastic death cloud sweep old Bozeman, Montana, and then me in a car 
I think that's pretty compelling. Yeah. You see, you know, I'm so old. How old are you? I'm so old. I remember the 1964 Alaska air earthquake. I was in third grade and it was, you know, Alaska was a remote thing. It had just become a state. And so we had that footage, the real footage from this guy who was a longshoreman who was on deck of a ship. And then, um, we were able to expand it and make it cool and exciting. I think it made it more compelling. Sure. No, on the science the viewer, show, we couldn't do anything like that, man. I think you guys show we made for like the lunch budget of the show. Different worlds for sure. And given how much the end of I kind of borrows from the language of disaster movies, uh, you know, I was thinking of things like Twister, you referenced Armageddon. Do you have any personal favorite movies that you were, you know, thinking of while making it? Towering Inferno, you know, when we need some volunteers and everybody steps forward. Everybody, they all want to volunteer. You know, that was a compelling moment. You know, and that, the other thing I liked about Towering Inferno, they just built a big model of a skyscraper and, I don't know, shot kerosene out of little jets or something. You know, and he's made in slow motion. It was, uh, it was a cool storytelling. It was storytelling with the technology that existed 50 years ago or whenever it was. I've always liked that one, but, uh, I'm not a big vampire movie guy or slasher movie where, you know, people are using special effects for all that stuff now. Climate change is obviously a very common thread in almost all the disaster scenarios. Uh, you're kind of upfront about being optimistic about our ability to combat human caused climate change. How do you retain that perspective and stay so optimistic given a lot of the grim news that we're seeing these days, especially in an era of science denialism? Well, you have to be optimistic or you're not going to get anything done. If you go into a game, athletic competition or card game or have you thinking you're going to lose, well, you'll probably lose. So you've got to think you can accomplish big things or you won't. And so, uh, that might be the same as optimism, but <laughs> it's, I don't see any other way of looking at it. And the other thing that makes me very optimistic is young people are not going to keep acting like this. As young people dominate the electorate, they are going to vote for leaders who are going to make changes and we're going to make changes and change the world. In the example I give all the time, both of my parents were veterans of World War II. My mom was recruited by the Navy to work on code breaking. She was a cryptanalyst. We asked her what she did during the war. My whole life, she would not say. She kept it secret, took it to her grave. Wow. My father was a prisoner of war captured from Wake Island, which you may not have ever heard right. of. It's in the middle of Pacific Ocean, nowhere. He spent four years as a prisoner of war. And I mention this because at that time, Everybody was winning the war. Everybody was fighting the war. Every farmer, every electrician, every truck driver, every scientist, everybody was working to resolve this global conflict. And they did. And so when this doom and gloom, hand wringing, whining just makes me crazy. Come on, people. We're the United States. Let's lead the world and get this done. Let's go. Yeah. That's awesome. I love it. Um, and I do want to talk solution. I like that in the episode on asteroids and comets, you mentioned NASA's DART mission. What was oh, your DART reaction? Was great. It was cool. Yeah. What was your reaction to the success of the mission last year? Oh, it's great. It's fantastic. You know, I was there. I was at the APL Applied Physics Lab in Maryland for that moment. The guy who's on the board of the planetary side is a good friend of mine. He worked on that mission and he was there. And it was just cool as heck. Another thing, tell you something interesting to me, sure. uh, not just about that mission, but about NASA writ large. Sitting in front of me, this woman turns around and says, hi, I'm Mindy Ripken. Oh, hi. It's nice to meet you, Ms. Ripken. That's very nice. It took me a beat. Cal Ripken Jr. was sitting there. Do you know what I'm talking about? I do, yeah. The baseball player who set yep. up several, all kinds of records, but the longest consecutive games. He's a big space enthusiast and he's a proud Marylander. And so he just was always there. He's always there for APL missions. This is his thing, man. He loved it. 
That's why I mentioned this because space exploration is inspirational. It brings out the best in us. It's where we solve problems that have never been solved before. It's cool. And when we find an asteroid with our name on it, we are going to do something about it. We are going to build a spacecraft or a set of spacecraft. We're going to study it. We're going to figure out the way, and we are going to come up with the money. We will, the world will come up with the money to keep us all from getting killed. Don't send yeah. Bruce Willis. It's not the way to do it. You have to do something more complicated and subtle. The thing they accomplished with DART wasn't, people weren't sure it was going to work. And the thing was so far away, you couldn't direct it by radio communication. The time for the radio signal to get there was too long. The thing had to drive itself, had to be autonomous. And it did, and it ran right into it. Wow. Except in space, there's no sound. It was just, and it worked. And so I just tell everybody, you know, NASA is the best brand the United States had. Every time NASA does something cool, it's cool. And yesterday, a de derived from investment by NASA is the SpaceX rocket that had a problem. But they will solve that problem. SpaceX will solve that problem. And they will fly that thing. Stand by. Are you excited about the Artemis mission? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we at the Planetary say we met with Jeremy Hansen, the Canadian announcer. He's a cool guy. And I'm really glad he's going to get a ride, as I say. Reminds me very much of Apollo 8. I was a kid for Apollo 8 where, okay, building giant rocket. We're going around the moon. Let's go. And they did. And that's where Bill Henders took that picture of Earth from with the surface of the moon in the foreground. Changed the world. Changed everybody the way everybody felt about being on Earth, on a planet. But I'll tell yeah. you what, man, I got to, I have another in 1130 Pacific time. Where are you? Yeah, on of course. Uh, I'm based in Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin. Yeah, Milwaukee. Yeah. So we have uh, you have one thirty there right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's just we so live much. on a big ball, man, and we have time zones. It's crazy. Earth is not flat. Who are you people in the twenty first century? People running around actually thinking the Earth actually might actually be flat. Very sure. I have failed. I have failed. As a science educator, it's all my fault. I always want work to be done. Bill, thank you so much. Thank you. Carry on. Yeah.